Isabella, do you know where my grandma's urn is? I don't know. But I don't move her. I pray to her every Tuesday. I don't know. Are you having one of these horrid Henry episodes again? Eureka! I put her with the worms. You put my grandma with the worms. The absolute state of British humor. Auntie Python didn't die for this. I don't think I really need to intro this. You read the title. I'm just, I'm just so tired of seeing this shit on my dash. Let me be clear. I don't, I don't have a problem with discourse. I like discourse. Discourse is usually good. But like every, every time they show me these tweets, it's just, it's just, you see this? Do you see this right now? I don't even like the show, and I, I know some of this is stretched. It's, it's always an exaggeration, an extrapolation, some kind of recontextualized hullabaloo. Maybe even just lies, you know? Lies are possible. Now, of course, you're saying, um, uh, you know, you can actually, uh, blacklist some tags, right? And I'm, and I'm saying, half of these clips are not even labeled. There is nothing to block exactly. There's nothing, there's nothing to blacklist here. I don't go out of my way to see this shit. It's just, it's been months by this point. And so in response to all of this, I have done something extremely extra that I would absolutely not recommend to anybody else. Unfortunately for all of these people, I have actually finished this TV series in an embarrassingly short window of time. Horrid Henry is a 2D animated blah, 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 fuck it. For once, for once on this channel, the history just does not matter. All you need to know is that this American lady living in Britain made this kid's book series in the mid-90s. Her publisher sold off the media rights, and about a decade after that, we got stuck with this shit. This shit. And now, now, we have to talk about it. Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna go through some shit, establish some lore, maybe re-clarify some things, and get the fuck out of here. This video is a big joke. I mean, <laughs> look at look at the date it was published, but we don't got all day. I know you got some you got some some practical jokes to get to, some good chuckle ha ha's. Let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna try to explain this as succinctly as possible because there's a lot of exposition to squeeze in a very little time. This discourse is squarely centered around the cartoon, but I think it's important to establish the vibes of the original stories. See, in addition to watching the cartoon, I have listened to audiobooks of the first 10 Horrid Henry books, which is about 40 short stories in total. I enjoyed my time with them, and unfortunately I can tell that there's a level of nuance to it that the cartoon would have had a hard time cracking as is, let alone with the discretion of thousands of Twitter users. The most standout way the author Francesca Simon has described this series is by calling it a western for kids. A grand epic that lets strong characters loose in a realm of pure escapism. The most basic joke it tells is that Henry isn't truly horrid, but like any other kid, he can play the part if he wants to. His idiotic parents are genuinely well-meaning, and they are trying their best, but they have no idea what the fuck is going on. There are many situations that are provoked or exacerbated by them springing a random activity on him and expecting him to go along with it. His reactions to various challenges and stimuli, and his manner of resistance bothers them so deeply, and they exhaust themselves trying to keep up with the horrid Henry of their nightmares. This psychological engagement they've created between not only them and Henry, but between him and Peter is on par with other literary giants. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Death Note. I, I, I think it was a lot like that. The very first story sets this dynamic up perfectly. I can, I can describe it off the dome. See, the first book establishes the horrid Henry of your imagination. They set the scene very, very well. And one day, like any other day, his mom pleads with him. Why can't you be more perfect? like Peter. And this day, this particular day, Henry decides to listen. He's like, hmm, you know, that, that might actually be good for a laugh, huh? So he decides to fuck with his family by not being a horrid, because this is apparently the one state of mind that seems to scare them even more than the default. So for the rest of that day, everything he does is diametrically opposed to what he would do in any other situation. And his family is so emotionally beaten down that they are pavloved into snapping at him even when he's not actively doing anything objectionable. Sit properly, Henry, said Dad. I am sitting properly, said Henry. 
Dad looked up from his plate. He looked surprised. So you are, he said. Even his brother is, is cooked. He tries to provoke him at the dinner table several times, but to no avail. And it ends with him throwing a plate of spaghetti at mom's head and being sent upstairs for it. The only reason why Henry gets in trouble that day is because he can't, he can't stop himself from, from chortling, from chuckling at the sight, and he gets, he gets grounded right after him. That's where the story ends. Now, a lot of pivoting to the animated series for a little bit, there's plenty of changes made in framing and in characterization that molds this setup into 101 different shapes. I believe that the first season did try to find a middle ground between the tone of the books and something more abstract and, uh cartoonish, would we say? By season five, shit is more or less off the rails. I have noticed that many of the clips that surfaced on Twitter either came from the earliest or the latest episodes. Originally, I had assumed that there was a hard evolution to compensate for, but I, I, I don't think it's there. Here, Henry's role in the stories is played with a bit more. I mean, he was always confident in his abilities, but especially early on, he's given a certain level of swagger not even Andy Larkin could match. It's not uncommon for him to address the audience while he is in the process of responding to the latest threat. Book Henry wasn't necessarily a broody character, but he was under the impression that he was the victim most of the time. He was allowed to see through that lens, even when he's menacing his way around his predicaments. Cartoon Henry almost thinks two steps ahead, even in episodes that are straight adaptations of the books, he's walking a very fine line between being reactive and being a schemer. Typically, him screaming in despair is the lead into to the title card, but even that feels tacked on at points. We can borrow an adage from the cartoon itself to summarize this set. Horrid is as horrid does. Season 1 did everything in its power to center the story around the horrid first and the Henry second. The character is still being defiant in the face of great obstacles and making a spectacle out of it, but it's a bit more celebratory here. It's an infectious energy punctuated by the switching theme songs halfway through. Ray, Ray, li listen to this. It's not fair. The mom and dad nag nag stand up straight, don't be rude. It's so not fair. Cause the killer boy rat stole school, stinks, keeps rude. By season 5, it does feel like we're all going through the motions to justify the presence of Horrid, when we've long since delved into the bog-standard pop culture references and mangled versions of beloved stock sitcom plotlines. In some ways, a lot of characters mellowed out, but tapping back into phrases and patterns that should be rote feel kind of unnatural here. Don't be Horrid, Henry. Now, in the beginning, the parents are close enough to their literary counterparts. They're perpetually tired, uniquely bumbling, slightly egocentric loons who I'm surprised can tie their own shoelaces in the morning. Utilizing the medium of animation underscores how little these people actually communicate, which is well in line with the source material. I would argue their own outbursts here are more dramatic to a degree, which gives the impression that they were pulled out of a Raw Dahl book, which is a bit of an abstraction to be honest. Take this one clip where Henry gets hosed by Peter and Gaslit in the process. It's true. I sprayed him. Well, Henry, you should have got out of the way when Peter was watering the flowers. This is actually from an episode inverting the premise of that first story. Instead of Henry traveling down the path of perfection, Peter chooses to haunt the family with his own botched brand of horrid behavior. I'm not going to fold my pajamas. And I'm not going to make my bed either. <sighs> That's really horrid. Where the parents were reluctant to let Henry exist before, they're quick to throw him under the bus here. Stretching the limits of the family dynamic is the main goal here, and it's pretty effective. I'm not saying they're not acting shitty, just that it's not entirely arbitrary. There's an exaggerated zeal with which they deal with Henry, but it's still placed within the realm of reality, which is the case for most of the other instances discussed. We could also refer to the one where the parents realize that he's not in the car while he's being blamed for bad traffic. Henry, listen to your father. <gasps> What's the matter? It's Henry. He's disappeared. What? The dialogue for that bit sounds pretty ridiculous, but immediately after, this is the tone that the parents took on. I can't believe we did that. We left him behind! We are such bad parents! Oh, 
poor Henry. I hope he's all right. What to do now? Oh, such a bad mother. Think, think. A little bit of a difference, right? I'll also note that Henry climbed out of the car at the last second to retrieve a comic book for the ride, so it's not like they just forgot he existed that morning and drove off without him. He is still forgotten, but, you know, nuance. Two adaptations from season one, Horrid Henry and the New Teacher and Horrid Henry Runs Away, both attempt to soften the blunt, slightly unhinged resolutions to their respective stories to mixed results. This is not the result of them being less edgy or hard to read, but more so because of the impact that's not supplied. A third segment, Hard Henry's Dance Class, changes the outcome to an objective positive, which made it fit well within these two pieces of media. The Henry Gets Told Off for Saying Good Morning clip precedes a plot about some chart to track good and bad behavior, and he's already annoyed the piss out of his mom by not wanting to get out of bed. It is literally setting up the plot of the episode. The Henry doesn't want to hear a joke clip comes from an episode about him taking the blame for shit that he didn't do. The entire episode is just him saying, mm, I don't know if that's my fault. It's season four and his brother is genuinely, genuinely terrible in his own right. Nobody ever talks about it, but he is fucking awful. They spent this whole season two episode letting Henry and dad bond over fishing by the lake. There's also this episode where they just decide to hit up this go-kart track all of a sudden. This never gets brought up again. But in the first one, they, they literally flaked on a family day in order to just uh, chill at the house and they ended up doing all this shit. And it was genuinely probably my most enjoyable moment with this show. I mean, I still don't like it, but it was a nice change of pace, you know? The bowl in the sink clip came from season five as did the cereal gaff and the dead worm bit. These are all the results, genuinely, of the show's own ADHD rattled brain trying to do a funny. Modern Horrid Henry is literally just modern family guy, wherein these versions of the show are so willfully abstract that they practically become their own continuity. Neither version is necessarily better than the other, they're just like two different shows. Most of the leads don't act like themselves with any sort of consistency because instead of letting actual children's writers do the work, the executive producer penned all the scripts by herself and decided to literally just do whatever the fuck she felt like. Peter Griffin's fully realized vision for Handy Quack season 45 is more coherent on average than a season of Horrid Henry. Now this, this one's almost the final boss. I, I love everything about this. Uh, from, from this, the terrible sound mixing, I mean, that's that's 80% of the show, to the, the parent shit-ass dancing, and the, the pair of preschool characters that come from this other shit that they made, and, and Henry's just, and just happy to see them, it's, it's, it's just, I must be missing some context, because uh, scolding the audience for going by scant clips while posting an extremely abnormal singular clip it's bonkers, yeah, totally nuts. Bonkers, no ifs, ands, or buts. <laughs> Simply put, the scene itself is a bizarre sight, but the parents being nice to Henry isn't. They almost always ease up when he's not being horrid, which is often because, again, that is the point of the character. They are wildly incompetent, but they do actually parent in ways that can't be neatly summed up in 20 second chunks. Ironically, this is perhaps highlighted well in episodes where a whole lot of nothing is happening, which become standard by season three. Anyway, I highlighted all those just to say that they perhaps aren't the predecessors to Icky Vicky. Ew, ew. A lot of the more exaggerated instances from season five are played for laughs, but this show is unfunny and um, nobody takes it in any humorous context because it's just not funny most of the time. There's not a lot about the show that is consistent except for the fact that Henry's parents are terrible at facilitating communication they're too pussy or easily flustered to maintain an actual dialogue with their kids, and in situations where they maintain some semblance of control, they actually tend to be pretty decent. When we were kids, the vast majority of us were much closer to Henry than Peter, and not all of our parents dealt with that in the exact same way. Many have rightfully pointed out that abusive parents can still do good things and still be monstrous pieces of shit. And I've seen nobody point out the reverse of that, that good parents can do fundamentally shitty, maybe even abusive things and still be good parents at the end of the day. 
I would be reluctant to call Henry's parents normal. I mean, good, bad, horrid, it's all subjective, but they are modeled after the average parent. They are not as far removed from reality as you'd think, and that says some about society. You see how this works? So characterizing them as cartoonish supervillains off the dome is understandable, of course, but it also works against the point of the character, and I don't understand why you would spend months talking about it if you're just going to dumb it down for everybody. Actually, you know what I got? I got one more clip in the roster that I think can sum this up pretty well. How come Great Aunt Greta's still here and Grandma isn't? She died when you were very little. Oh, that was a long time ago. This clip of Mom sharing memories of Henry's grandmother comes from a short film aptly titled Horrid Henry and the Groovy Grandma. To summarize the British analog to St. Jude's Children's Hospital put together a campaign to encourage play in children during the pandemic and this was produced to accompany it. As such, the film is focused on modeling some behaviors and thoughts kids may experience around the concept of grief. In the books, Henry's grandmother has appeared sparingly, I think like twice in total, maybe mentioned a few more times, but she had not appeared at all in the cartoon up to this point, which was quite serendipitous given the subject matter. The circumstances around this chat are uncommon, you know, I, I don't think they'd be having serious conversations like this in any average episode, but the motivations and general demeanor of our leads are as common as houseflies. Henry not having any real experiences with his grandmother serves as an avenue for mom to unpack some of her own grief. While not abnormal for the time it was produced, one may find a relaxed dialogue between the two of them to be a bit odd. But trust me when I say this is pretty routine at this point in the show. Taking a peek behind the curtain, you'll find a production as rough and uneven as our title character. Adaptations are hard work. Even the bad ones have a lot of thought put into them, and this one, consensus on general quality aside, is no exception. Being considerate of the source material is typically seen as the main box to check, but this may be one of the few instances where studying the producing body may give you a better understanding of the final product. Because if you understand a fraction of the changes made, you too might adjust your expectations of this family unit. I understand how just saying that may not mean as much compared to what you've already seen online. I mean, there's no way those clips were presented in an obfuscated manner without proper context. No way at all. So I guess this is the part where I put my meat on the table and show my work here. This series entered development sometime in 2003 when the original publisher sold the media rights to Novel Entertainment. Known by a married pair of former TV executives, the company became known for producing the Fimble Cinematic Universe. They had experience with puppetry, but not with animation. And as soon as the following year, they were ready to put Henry into production. Coincidentally, around the same time period, they were also responsible for developing future preschool animated wonderkind, Pocoyo. As of today, Horrid Henry has been aired in over 90 countries. With the help of Nelvana for the first season, the series has presumably seen a wide reach in distribution. Disney Channel has hosted it in France, Cartoon Network throughout Asia, and more recently Nickelodeon has taken control of its airing rights in the UK. Only around 45% of the show up to now has been written by actual children's writers rather than the executive producer and co-founder of the production company. For half of those episodes, said writers share a co-writing credit rather than a full one. Season 1 is the only season to fully feature their work, going from utilizing 17 writers across the first 52 to using 11 writers across 38 episodes of season 2, down to only 2 returning for 22 episodes of season 3. Out of these episodes, over half of them are a co-writer credit shared with the executive producer. Every other episode gives her a sole credit. And uh, if you take a listen to her process, I don't really, don't really understand why. People suggest ideas, we get some people like you will write in with, you know, just say, what if Henry did this? Or, or someone will tell me a story when my children were little, they used to come back and tell me stories about what they'd done at school or what their friends had done. Um, and then we have other people, and I have a great person called Toby. I don't know if Toby's here today, but he comes up. Oh, so Toby and Toby. I sit and we, we eat a lot of um, chocolate and we come up with <laughs> mad ideas for the things, sort of things that Henry might do. Literally, could you be like walking friends. around the supermarket and you'll see something? Oh, oh that would be a yeah. good idea for Henry. Yeah, or... yeah. 
Last year, she was also part of this panel discussion with other kids' TV producers, and the subject of AI came up. If you said to me, am I worried that um, an AI program might be able to write a series of Horrid Henry scripts, I'd say, no, I'm absolutely delighted that they would be able to do that. I'd like to think, and maybe um, this is what Nick Cave's thinking too, I'd like to think they couldn't do it quite as well as I could, and therefore I can polish them. But the idea of someone doing the basics, fantastic for me. No comment. Within season five, eight episodes of the show are animated with rigged character models. Horrid Henry and the Demon Dentist, Horrid Henry and the Detention Diva, Horrid Henry, The Road to Nowhere, Horrid Henry, Planet of the Grapes, Horrid Henry and the Good Day, Bad Day, Horrid Henry and the Dream Drone, Horrid Henry and the Funny Bunny Hop, and Horrid Henry, My So-Called Life. It is unclear whether a full transition to rigs will be made for future episodes, but it's worth noting that the fully original Netflix special released after the season concluded was traditionally animated. A few months before the second season premiered, the original 18-track version of Horrid Henry, the most horrid album, was released. Many of these tracks have been copiously reused and shoved into various episodes. I assume they're taking a few tips from Disney themselves and trying to capitalize on cartoon music. Many of them officially debuted in the stage show of indeterminable source material, Horrid Henry Live and Horrid. To date, it seems to be the only piece of incidental Horrid Henry media that Francesca Simon approves of, but we'll get to that later. Her and the guy that portrayed Henry in the show became good friends, and I like to think that she's indirectly responsible for him becoming the author of this spin-off line of Dennis and Nasher books. That's ancillary though, let me let me tell you how many times these songs were shoehorned into this show. Rockstar is used a lot as incidental music and, and diegetic too, to be honest. The song about girls being better than boys has appeared four times? I don't know, has appeared, I don't know, once, I think? Born to be Rude has appeared four times in the series, and if you watch the full music video on YouTube, you could easily find where each instance starts and stops. This song can literally cut off neatly uh, at the end of certain verses. You, you would understand which episode they were placed in. My song was used twice. It's sung from Henry's perspective. The, the last instance to date being the cornerstone of an episode lazily constructed around the idea of Henry's band filming a music video and everybody, literally everybody around him wanting in. The entire neighborhood shows up for this to compensate for the lack of interesting visuals and the lack of good composition here makes my skin itch. I I mean, what the what the fuck is all this? I've uh, I've the teacher Miss Battleaxe's addition to the soundtrack "Sweet Big Sister" is a clear riff on the song "Sweet Transvestite" from Rocky Horror Picture Show. You may not think I've got a lot to give, but when it comes to life, I've got a lot to learn. No, I don't have any fucking idea why they did this. Thanks for asking. I, I don't know. There are 17 instances across 15 episodes of characters uttering a catchphrase derivative of a previous novel entertainment character, Roly Moe. He is another inhabitant of the Fimble's cinematic universe who carried his own spin-off series. Maybe like, I want to say like a year before Henry started. There are also three or four physical appearances of the character across these five seasons. In a season five episode, they also sing his theme song in the car. Roly, 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 mo. He's the rolliest mo you'll ever know. And his name is Roly Mo. Henry is embarrassed by this display, but in a mid-season four episode, we probably mentioned this already, he is pleasantly surprised by the appearance of two side characters from the show that appear at his birthday party. These are some of the many choices made in the process of making this show, and I hope recounting this was at least slightly entertaining because otherwise I do not know of a single reason for me to divulge this, other than maybe to lead into the next part, which I think is the most important one, so strap in for this. That was a lot of narrative and technical context to drop on you. Kudos for sticking it out this long. I wanted to try and wind down by connecting these back to exploring intent and function. It's not uncommon for authors to distance themselves from adapted versions of the work, mainly attributed to the level of creative control they may have. They can be just as detrimental as they could be beneficial, and while there's not always a legal obligation to include them depending on the contract, it typically looks better if a new adaptation can receive a high level of cooperation early on. 
As far as I can see, there has never been much of a conscious relationship cultivated between Francesca Simon and the producers of the TV show. There is very little information alluding to how she felt about the project during development, but we certainly do know how she feels about it in current years. Would you like that to be in a Horrid Henry movie? No, because I really don't like the Horrid Henry movie. I had nothing to do with it, and I don't think it bears any resemblance to Horrid Henry. So I'm all about the books. If you don't like the movie, do you like the programs? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry for those of you who like the programs. No, I don't, again, because I don't think they're anything like Horrid Henry, and they could be called something completely different. So yeah, that is a great sadness to me, that they're not better. But what can you do? <laughs> it seems like Simon didn't have the option to offer any significant level of input, which is relevant to the view that the cartoon is not like the books. She seems to have been outspoken about her disapproval since sometime after the movie was released. This has been implied that the sale of Henry's media rights was out of her hands, but it's also been expressly stated that the deal made was not properly compensating her, even if legally acceptable. To date, the 22 Horrid Henry titles have sold more than 18 million copies. There are at least two new ones in the works. Simon, meanwhile, is now locked in a legal battle with Novel Entertainment in a dispute about royalties for the Horrid Henry TV show said to be CITV's most successful show ever. I relied on Orion to negotiate with Novel. They did a poor deal. They did not use a lawyer. They assigned the worldwide rights forever with no reversion rights for non-use, for example. They allowed Novel to roll up the profits of one series into the production costs of the next, and they pay themselves whatever production and other fees they wanted without any limitations. From a personal perspective, it seems unusual that the license was handed to Novel in the first place. Much of the business is centered around the people you know, and it's not unbelievable that some strings could have been pulled even for a newer entity. Novel has certainly kept up well with the licensing side of things. Even without concrete numbers, it stands to reason that there would be some additional leverage to use. The rights were sold a few years after the stories were established. I can only imagine what the publisher itself got out of this. I mean, the outcome of this situation came straight out of a Henry volume. I don't intensely feel anything at the moment, but I probably harbor a level of contempt for this cartoon just by virtue of how it was made. I immensely respect everybody who physically made the cartoon possible. The voice cast, the directors, the timers, the prop designers, the character designers, the background painters, the inkers, everyone who did retakes, all of them. Respect them immensely. I do not respect those who produced it. And I mean, like, it's not like the final product was that bad. Like, there's certainly better, but the first two seasons of the show, it's not bad rainy day viewing. There's other factors that go into a thing's reception other than quality, and personally, especially given how much of a public trash fire our side of the animation industry has been lately, I find it difficult to reconcile all of these decisions that feel anti-art in many ways, or at the very least, anti head Simon is speaking clearly from the perspective of the original books, on the intent of the original versions of these characters. She has no clear place or desire to speak on the media that came after it, as she believes that they don't stack up to the original works that she's involved in. This has been public knowledge for at least a decade by this point, predicated by the advent of her character being commodified on the big screen. Her view on the book's appeal has been expressed many times over, and while there's no one definitive explanation, I find this one to be rather succinct. I suppose because I see a lot of comedy in family life, and I think it's also a way of laughing at myself as a parent. Because sometimes you hear, even though I have one very well-behaved son, you sometimes hear yourself as a parent, and all you're doing is criticizing. And just to hear that kind of voice in my head makes me laugh, and I suppose makes me more aware of it. Having said all of that, my big question for the fucking peanut gallery over there, why are we taking this clip, explicitly dissecting the appeal of the books, and applying it to versions of her story that she directly said do not resemble her work? Framing it in a context is explicitly meant to not represent. Why are we ignoring the obvious context at play? Why are we not engaging with the actual text? 
If consuming it in isolation, you have an incomplete, stilted, clunky view of this world, its characters, and everything attempted within, it's because the people who made this shit had an incomplete, stilted, clunky view of the house this woman built. Producers make changes all the time, it's not uh, inherently a bad thing, they're necessary. But if the show can't even keep consistent with its own version of canon, why should I be expected to read it from the lens of a whole other medium altogether? You keep fucking ignoring this woman when she's gone out of her way to speak for her books and only her books. And yet you yell at everybody else that descends to your hyper-specific view of a dizzying, diluted, and distorted facsimile of this universe? A universe the original author has seemingly never had a single ounce of control over. This is the first time I've had to seriously consider the possibility of an animated product being used as part of a money laundering scheme. How the fuck do you misunderstand a children's book series this badly? I don't even like the cartoon and I understand it. Death of the author didn't cease to exist or nothing, it still applies here to some extent. Though you might have more of an issue applying it to a piece of media that is notably vacuous and floating in liminal space. It's not thought provoking, it's not culturally defining, it's not doggedly unique or determined to be anything of any real impact. It's not good, it's not great either, it's not even particularly horrid. Which might as well be a fucking death sentence at this point. It's just not fair. It's so not fair. Horrid Henry reminds me that we ultimately live in a society, not because it had a lot to say, but more so because it demonstrated how far these seemingly unimportant microcosms spread out and affect the course of history. Somewhere, at some time, a butterfly flapped its wings, and down the line it led to cartoon abuse discourse on Twitter. What a fucking legacy. I think I do have a new level of appreciation for the source material, but I'm probably never, ever choosing to engage with this shit again. I might finish them audiobooks on a rainy day, but who, who knows? Who knows? This is time better spent on Dennis and Nasher. Look, I have no intent on gatekeeping Horrid Henry. Of all things, like I said at the top, discourse isn't really an issue for me. It's just, if we're making it a point to dive headlong into discussions based on heavy subject matter that could reflect back on real life phenomena and make it everybody else's problem, there has to be some modicum of research here, right? Nobody should be binge watching this even if they like the show. But a little extra looking into things is helpful. It's obscenely helpful. If you're gonna do metatextual analysis, you actually have to engage with the text first. But maybe, maybe the ultimate lesson is, um, 